Welcome to the Pilot's Inner Circle on Flight Training Radio, where a good pilot is always learning. Now, here's your host and certified flight instructor extraordinaire, Jason Shoppert. Hey, everyone. Jason Shoppert here, and welcome to something... uh, something I'm really excited about and something new we are doing, and that is M0A.com Flight Training Radio, uh, a part of the Pilot's Inner Circle, which uh, maybe I know a lot of you guys uh, already know about, but refresh some of your memories. The Pilot's Inner Circle is the new um, uh, membership we're working on to help pilots continue uh, their education even beyond their checkride and listening to podcasts and radio shows just like this one you can earn FAA WINGS credit, which is uh, working towards renewing your certificate. Think of WINGS credit as the uh, the CEUs uh, in your flight train, those continuing education units. And if that's something you want to check out more of, you can visit pilotsinnercircle.com to learn more. What you're listening to right now is the free portion, the uh, uh, open for everybody. And at the end of the show, uh, we'll close it out for uh, members only, uh, and the members only will have access to the rest of that. So anyways... Um, Let's get started with this. First things first, uh, guys, I am up for any and all flight train related questions. You guys can call in right now, uh, toll free. The number is 877-537-6704. And if you're listening live on m0a.com or on uh, groundschoolacademy.com forward slash live, that's the page you can listen at. Uh, That number is there. And that number, once again, is uh, 877-537-6704. 537-6704. Any of your flight train questions, I'm happy to uh, take those. We'll also be monitoring the uh, the Twitter and the Facebook feeds, too. Uh, so any questions you guys have there, free feel, uh, feel free to call in, and we'll uh, chat a little bit about your flight train topics. So what I have on the agenda for us today is this. Engine fires on start. Winter... Uh, <laughs> at least in Florida. Winter is getting close. We have a few cool days. We bust out a long sleeve t-shirt every now and then. Today I'm in a long sleeve t-shirt, shorts and flip flops. So we're getting we're getting closer to winter, I feel like. Um, I know some of my more uh, northerly people, I was talking to uh, Larry, who's a CFI who helps out in M0A.com stuff. Uh, he's up in Michigan. And we're talking about freezing levels at the surface and everything. I'm thinking, man, we just don't deal with that sort of stuff in Florida. We're really spoiled. Granted, it does get cold here. Um, But with winter getting close, this is a great time to talk about those engine fires on start. Now, why is this? Well, the thing you need to understand is, according to the NTSB, 8 out of 10 engine fires actually happen during the winter. So 80%, over 80% of our, let me rephrase that statement, 80%, 80%, 8 out of 10 of our engine fires on start happen during the winter months, in the colder months. Why on earth is this the case? Well, when it is cold, we as student pilots, because I think we're all student pilots, um, tend to overprime. It's just what, it's just a, a common um Problem. We tend to overprime the engine. We think it's cold. Man, this thing's going to take a lot of muscle to get this thing started. So these students, and again, we're all students, tend to overprime the engine. Now, when you overprime that engine, you are literally, no pun intended, adding fuel to the fire. That's just yeah, you know how it works. That engine already doesn't want to start, and you're over priming it. Some other things that can contribute to are things like a dirty air filter. That's why you're supposed to change your air filter at every annual. At least your mechanic should be doing that for you. Um, but the main reason is because of that over priming. Okay, so let's talk real quick. What are the two scenarios? The two scenarios for an engine fire on start. Well, the first one is this. We're sitting there. I'm your flight instructor. You're the student. We're going up to have a great flight today. Um, We're going to start the engine. The engine starts. However, we notice smoke billowing out of the 
out of the cowling. Or we literally see flames, you know, coming up and out, uh, uh, you know, of some of those air vents. The engine started, however, it's on fire. This honestly is the preferred situation to have an engine, <laughs> if there were a preferred situation with a, uh, your engine catching on fire, um, this would be the preferred one. Engine fire on start, the engine does start is the preferred situation. Um, follow your POH, easiest way to put it. I mean, any of this advice I'm giving you should be, uh, you know, taken for Jason said this, my POH says this. Okay, let's, let's take the best of both worlds here. Follow your POH, but a great rule of thumb is to run up the engine. So the engine catches on fire, I want to run it up to a higher RPM setting, similar to doing your, um, similar to just doing your run up. Okay, run it up to that 1700, 1800, maybe 2000 RPMs, whatever your run up calls for. In an attempt, the reason you're even doing this is you want to suck those flames back down into that engine, okay? Running it up, trying to extinguish the fire yourself by sucking those flames back down into that engine. Now, that's all well and good. We, and this is a very popular check ride question too. He gives this exact scenario. Okay, we extinguish the fire. Are we going flying now? Heck no, we're not going flying. We're not going anywhere. My engine just caught on fire, for goodness sake. Doesn't that tell you something? Um, and I'll show you a story uh, about that here towards the end. But just because you extinguish the fire doesn't mean you're going flying that day. You've got a deeper-rooted problem than you even know. Uh, and you may have caused a few more problems by having open flames in the engine. You know, the fire is supposed to be inside the engine, not all around uh, and, and coming out of the engine. Um, so... By running it up, we want to suck those flames back down into that engine. Assuming you extinguish the fire, it's fuel off, mixture to idle, and evacuate. Get the heck out of that thing. Who knows if you properly extinguished it? Um, you know, grab the fire extinguisher. You know, just get the, uh, the heck out of that airplane. Okay, and again, if you guys have any questions on this stuff, I'm happy to uh, take your call live right now. The number to do that is 877-537-6704. Four. That number is toll free, so you guys can uh, uh, check that out. Also, uh, Twitter and Facebook will be monitoring too, so uh, we'll grab some questions there as well. Um, so that's if um, the engine does start. Now, what if the engine does not start? And this is more commonly the case. If the engine does not start, you are to do a few things. Again, all let's let's look at your POH first, then let's let's see what I uh, you know what I say here and how that jives with what your POH says. But you want to continue cranking, literally keeping that starter engaged, continue cranking, all in an effort to still suck those flames back down into that engine where the fire is supposed to be inside of that engine. You want to continue cranking. Now, how long do you crank for? I've heard people say, oh, crank for two to three minutes. And I think to myself, you've got to be kidding me. If my engine's on fire, I know exactly how much fuel I have in this airplane. I'm going to crank, you know, maybe 30 seconds, and then I'm boogieing on out of that airplane. 30 to 60 seconds, and I'm boogieing out of that airplane. That's just, that's just my uh, opinion, you know. They, and I'll say, thank goodness that airplane's insured, too, on my way out of the airplane. But it's going to be continue cranking, fuel off, mixture back to idle, evacuate and extinguish. Um, and, and this is one bit where it's going to be super important to have a passenger briefing, which we'll chat about here in just a little bit. Um, uh, but imagine that I'm flying, uh, or I'm your flight instructor, you're my student, uh, we could have some sort of agreement that says, hey, in the event of an engine fire on start, I'm going to sit here and continue cranking it, while well, you evacuate the airplane to the rear, obviously, please don't in the haste of all that's going on, evacuate to the front, always evacuate into the rear, open the door, run towards the tail. That's what I mean by that. And in the hangar, there's a fire extinguisher on the south wall. Or, you know, most newer airplanes have a fire extinguisher in the airplane. Most airplanes should if they don't. Um, Hey, there's a fire extinguisher in the baggage compartment. Evacuate the airplane, open up the baggage compartment or, you know, reach over uh, the rear seat, grab the fire extinguisher, evacuate, and put this thing out. Obviously, stay away from the propeller, but I'll continue cranking while you do that. 
these are the kinds of things you can go over in a passenger brief. And um, uh, so you have that established. It's kind of like why we talk about a sterile cockpit, why we talk about positive exchange of flight controls. Okay, that is why we have this sort of stuff. Okay, so if the engine does not start, continue crank. I once had a student tell me when we were talking about this, um, they said, Jason, you know, I understand that you want me to continue cranking, but isn't that really bad for the starter? You always told me, don't, don't try to start it too long because it's bad for the starter. <laughs> and I kind of smiled. I said, you're right. It is bad for the starter. And I don't want you to just crank, crank, crank my airplane because it's not starting. That inherently is bad for the starter. Trust me, in 2012 alone, I put three starters in my airplane. Um, apparently, we need to practice engine starts a little bit more. Um, but if you were to have an engine fire on startup, I can tell you right now, the starter will be the least expensive thing you will purchase because there's going to be um, some bills that are going to get incurred from having an engine fire on start. And, you know, that's just aviation. That's how it works sometimes. But the starter is, again, the least of your worries in that situation. Okay. So, um, and, and, and again, um, I've talked about this a bunch of times. In fact, most of you guys, I'm sure um, you have a copy of my new book, the In-Flight Emergencies book, uh, where I share my story of, uh, of an engine fire on start, my personal story of having an engine fire, um, not only on start, but effectively in flight, on takeoff of all situations. Um, so really, uh, and I won't bore you with that story. I'm sure most of you heard it from the book and everything else. But um, the important thing is to know those procedures that we just mentioned. Have a flow check memorized. I mean, can you imagine? Yeah, I've got this great checklist for an engine fire on start, but are you really going to be fumbling with a checklist when your engine's on fire? No, you're not. You won't even look at that checklist. I'm just being honest with you. And the FAA is even coming out now and saying, listen, checklist usage, um, we used to want you to have your that checklist in hand and follow it to a T every time. Now the FAA has come as far as saying, hey, you know, do it and then double check just to, just to be on the safe side. And the engine fire on start, either case, whether it starts or doesn't start, um, it's just something you're just going to have to in, just know to do. Um, and that's why this is stuff you can share fly and, and practice, you know, from that standpoint. So anyways, guys, we're going to take a, uh, a quick uh, – about a two-minute commercial break real quick, um, and then we're going to get back. I'm going to share with you some stories of uh, some engine fires on start um, and some more great techniques uh, for some engine fires in flight. So I'll be back with you guys here in just about two minutes. Chat with you then. Are you prepared for an engine failure on takeoff? What if there was runway remaining? What if there isn't? Would you know what to do if you lost radio communications in IFR conditions? My newest book, In Flight Emergencies, a step-by-step -step guide to handling the unexpected, will cover all of this and more. Readers learn about a topic, such as engine failures on takeoff, then at the end of the chapter there's a URL where they can go and watch a video of an actual engine failure on takeoff and see how the pilot applied the skills mentioned in the book. We're adding videos you love to the books you need because a good pilot is always learning. Check out the book at inflightemergencies.com. Hey there, quick question. What would you do if you lost your logbook? Imagine having to go back in time to track down all of those hours, dates, aircraft flown, and airports landed at. It's near impossible. Trust me, I've done it. Welcome to Runway Log, the best online pilot logbook that lets you log flights on your iPhone, iPad, or Android device. Attach photos to certain entries and see where you've been with our interactive map. Best of all, it's backed up every hour and fully exportable to CSV or PDF. Runway Log has your back. It even sends reminders when your flight review is due. Don't wait another second. Start your free trial of Runway Log today. Visit runwaylog.com. Hey 
guys. Jumping right back to it. By the way, I forgot to um, uh, mention early that this Flight Train Radio, the Pilots Inner Circle, um, this is something we are going to be doing without fail. Um, we're going to be doing it every single Monday at um, actually uh, this time, 3 p.m. my time. So every single Monday you'll have an opportunity, hopefully maybe for some of my West Coast guys during a lunch break or for um, um, some of my East Coast guys just kind of catching you getting off work and everything else or uh, during a relaxing time. If not, obviously this is all being recorded so you guys can check it out um, a little bit later. But um, yeah, Every Monday at 3 p.m., you guys will have something new and exciting to look forward to. So I'm really, uh, um, uh, really uh, just uh, blessed to bring this stuff to you guys. By the way, um, any questions you guys have, um, that number to call in at uh, toll free is 877 537 6704. So you guys will be able to um, uh, call in uh, with your questions. And uh, we'll be able to uh, chit chat from there. By the way, when you call in on that uh, that number, which again is eight seven seven five three seven six seven zero four, I believe it's going to prompt you to press one. Uh, that way, it comes up to uh, my lovely producer and wife Ashley, uh, so she can then screen that call um, and get you on the air from there. So, um, anyways, let's kind of continue our uh, our conversation here with the uh, the engine fire situation. And again, I know we're talking about engine fire today, but any questions you guys have, I'll take them. Um, if it's flight train related, that's that's totally okay. Uh, we'll we'll work it all in there. So, I, and I want to share with you a story here. I was long before I actually purchased a five one two Romeo, my beloved little um, Cessna one fifty. Um, I was looking at a few different airplanes, and this one airplane I looked at was beautiful. So it was a Piper Warrior. The price was right, had the avionics I wanted, and the thing I liked most about it was the engine time was so low. I mean, it was absolutely awesome how low the engine time was. I was thinking to myself, man, this is, this is cool stuff. Um, I think it had like two or 300 hours on the engine. I got a hold of the log books and I was kind of, uh, you know, um, you know, checking everything out and going through that sort of stuff. And um, um, I remember looking at the log books and thinking the the very first engine um, was euthanized effectively uh, uh, early. Um, and I remember thinking to myself, why why did they overhaul the engine? And I use the word euthanized, obviously. Uh, why did they why did they overhaul this engine so early? And and Shane, I see your or I'm uh, sorry, Steve, I see your question. I'll get you on here in just a second. Um, what actually happened? And he actually in the winter time in Jacksonville, in Florida, of all places, had a um, um, engine fire on start, and ended up having to actually overhaul that engine so i mean just uh you know a, a real um you know devastating thing but i mean that's the, that's the kind of stuff that can uh happen here and um and let's see real quick here i'm going to ask um i've got a few callers here we're going to take a uh, few calls here um Hey, um, Steve, you're uh, live on the air, my friend. How the heck are you doing? I'm doing good, Jason. Things are going pretty good down here in Houston. But my awesome. question, yeah, it's good to good to hear from you. Absolutely. Uh, what I'm interested in is exactly what kind of damage is a fire on engine start going to do? What kinds of things get uh, get torn up? And what's the difference going to be the difference between uh, a fuel injected engine and uh, a, a carbureted engine with a primer, as far as what kind of damage is going to incur. I know mm -hmm. that on the fuel injected engines, we've got uh, a lot of problems with uh, with flooding them easily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, does that pro does that give us a different scenario? I mean, I know the procedure is going to be the same for shutdown, but you know, what's going on up there? 
Right, absolutely. And you made a great point. The thing you need to remember is the procedure, if the engine catches on fire, remains the same. And we're, we're talking about two different animals. A fuel-injected airplane, like you said, is more prone to flooding, which then is now adding more fuel to the fire. However, with your carbureted engines, and, and I, I know you're a handy guy, so you understand this stuff, you got to remember that fuel is just simply pooling up inside of that carburetor. So now you've got this, you know, this lake of fuel effectively sitting in that carburetor. And if that's what causes the spark, because now think about, and, I, and what have you been flying lately, Steve? I know you've been jumping around from Viking to all sorts of different stuff. What have you been flying a lot lately? Mostly I've been flying the Super Viking lately. But, okay, gotcha. uh, I go between that and a 172. Okay, great. So let's use let's use an older 172 as an example. Think of that carburetor hanging out in the front, and think about where that air filter is too. Now imagine that air filter. You've been doing some soft field landings out there in Houston. It's been getting real, uh, you know, dirty and ugly. You know, a dirty air filter is a great ingredient to start a uh, have an engine fire on start. So now I've got that dirty air filter. I've got that pool of fuel sitting in my carburetor because I just, you know, really just gave it, you know, too much and everything else. You know, that can cause a real nasty situation. Now, whereas with the fuel injected airplanes, I'm actually injecting that right into sometimes all of the cylinders. Usually just one cylinder is where I'm injecting it to. So now if you have a internal engine problem, now you're pooling up fuel actually in the cylinders and that can cause a real nasty uh, reaction. It could also even cause a detonation or a pre-ignition problem um, that could also cause damage to your engine. The, uh, and the ultimate thing is, I was sharing that story while you're on hold with the Warrior, is, I mean, the poor gentleman had to overhaul the engine. And I shared the story too about the, the, the kid that was worried about chewing up my starter if the engine caught on fire. And I'm thinking, the starter is the least of your worries, um, <laughs> you know, that case. You know, let, let's extinguish this thing, let's survive, and then we'll let a mechanic assess this. But I would be willing to bet, I have no factual evidence to back this up, it's just my personal opinion, but I'd be willing to bet nine times out of ten you're going to end up overhauling the engine. And that's just the real unfortunate, um, you know, situation um, behind it. So, uh, um, yeah, but Steve, my friend, it's so good to hear from you, and I appreciate your uh, question. I'm going to throw you on mute real quick, my friend, so you have a great day, and I'm going to jump to some other calls, Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Steve. See ya. All right. Um, jumping around here uh, real quick. Um, let's stick with the engine fire uh, theme here. Um, Shane, my friend, you are live. What's happening, man? How are you? I'm doing great, Jason. It is really cool to watch you expand the ways that you get your training and your things out and it's just this is cool i'm glad to be a part of it today awesome dude i'm i'm glad you're a part of it too my friend so what's happening with you what's your question well i wanted to know you know you had mentioned going through the logs in your aircraft uh whenever you purchased it and it had brought up a question about why the engine had been overhauled and that's what kind of alerted you to uh the fire that had occurred prior mm -hmm. and i guess my question is is let's say you are renting an aircraft or purchasing an aircraft is there another place that uh, the the pilot might look to see where there may have been a, uh, an engine fire in the past. Uh, just you know, if nothing else, for knowledge. But you know, especially in a purchase situation, I would think that that would be pertinent information. Well, absolutely. And you know, the log books are your your best bet for that. And I'll tell you, to dig deeper into that story, I had to be more like the uh, the coroner, you know, in that case, because it didn't blatantly come out and say, yeah, we had an engine fire, so we overhauled the engine. I was just looking at it and going, man, this engine had 1,100 hours on it, and now I have an engine that has 200 hours on it. You know, why did they, again, using that word, euthanize that engine ahead of time? Um, so that really brought up the flags, and I brought it to the owner, and he would, came out and was honest with me. But you, you got to know, I mean, that's not something they're going to advertise. No one's going to come out and say, yeah, we had a prop strike last week, or yeah, the engine caught on fire a couple months ago. No, one, no one's going to tell you that sort of stuff. So you've got to really, you know, dig deep into that. Um, and it's more than just 
I mean, the logbooks are the intricate part of it, but all your times need to match up from the tack time between this oil change and that oil change. You know, what happened in between? Do all the times match up? Now, that's for purchasing an airplane. Um, renting an airplane, um, a lot of people think maybe it's a little bit anal, but I like to look over the logbooks of an airplane I'm going to be renting. I'll have students sometimes come to me and say, hey, Jason, um, I want to use you as my instructor, but I want you to teach me in this airplane. And I say, sure, that's fine, but I'd like to see the logbooks. Not that I don't think the airplane's going to fly great, not that I don't trust the owner, but I want to know a little bit of what I'm getting myself into. I want to see the history of this airplane. So you know what? The FBO may look at you a little bit funny, but ultimately you are paying their salary by renting their airplanes. Uh, they should have those logbooks on file uh, you know, in the FBO somewhere. Um, and most people now, they have a PDF they can send you. So it's really just something you can dig through. Maybe you don't know what you're looking at. Hey, send it over to me. I'd be happy to look at it. Or send it over to a, another pilot or mechanic buddy of yours just to kind of know the history of the airplane. I mean, when I bought 512 Romeo, one of the coolest things I found out, and it wasn't cool back then, but I don't have the original engine that came from the Cessna factory. It actually got stolen back in 1977. And again, I, I mean, funny stuff. I mean, first off, I want to know, how on earth do you steal an engine? Obviously, it was sitting on the ramp and somebody had too much time on their hands. But And, and that didn't affect the value at all. I could care less about that. I got a great engine. It works fine. But these things you learn about your airplane if these people are keeping their logbooks up to date. So just pretty neat stuff like that. I would really consider, um, you know, in your situation, kind of digging into that stuff and looking over that. So uh, hopefully uh, – um, that helps you, my friend. Any other questions, though, or anything related to that? Buddy, that is perfect. Thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the rest of your broadcast, man. Cool, man. You too. Keep learning all you can, okay? Thank you, sir. All right. See you, man. All right. I'll, I am going to uh, take I'm going to take two more questions here, guys, and then we're going to uh, wrap it up. Uh, let's see. Who's been on hold longer here? Um, my friend, Bob, you have been on hold uh, the longest year. I'm sorry, Bob. How the heck are you doing? I am excellent. Thank you. And I want to thank you for all that you're doing. You're going to grow this show. You're going to be the most popular and best instructor in the nation because you focus on people and learning. You're sincere. You have integrity. And you have character. And your wife is a great gal, too. So keep up the good show. I'm too old to do anything. I'm 70 years old, and I live in Tucson, Arizona, but if I lived in your part of the country, I'd be knocking on your door, sir. Thank you, and good day. Bob, you're a blessed man, and I appreciate that. You have a great day, okay? See ya. Ah, Bob's a nice guy. I like Bob. i got to remember that now. All right. Uh, the last question I'm going to take today comes from my buddy, Randy. Randy, my friend, you are live. How the heck are you doing? I'm doing pretty well today. Awesome, man. What's your question? Uh, question is, I have quite a bit of time toward my uh, uh, light sport pilot license. I continue to make the rookie mistake of not looking in the right place, not looking downfield when I'm uh, coming in for a landing and leveling off. Do you have any secrets for helping to enforce the proper behavior on that? Randy, you are, first off, you're, you are in the right spot by what you said there, which was looking. Um, one thing I love to teach is landings because it is, uh, as much as it is a feel game, it is a sight game. And let me just, let me run you through a few things. First off, a perfect landing starts with a perfect pattern. One of the questions people love to ask me is, well, Jason, what altitude should I be on base? Well, I'll tell you. You know what, I'd like to see you on 700 feet at base. I know we're talking AGL here. Um, but 700 feet would be a really high if you're only a half mile from the runway. Or 700 feet could be really low if you're a mile from the runway. So there is no defined you know, altitude when it comes to your perfect pattern. I want you to nail your airspeed. And if you're a light sport airplane, I bet you'd be something like, hey, 80 on uh, you know, downwind, let's go 75 on base, 70 on long final, and slow into 60 to 65 on short final. Um, so focus first off on that perfect pattern. And actually, it's cool that you asked this question because I think this week, if I can get it done in time, I'm going to have some landing analysis videos where I've shot a lot of you know, through-the-cockpit footage, and we're going to analyze some landings, so I think that will help. Um, let's jump to final now. If you're on final, 
Your flaps are where you want them to be. And I like to land, I'm a 20 degree flap kind of guy, so maybe play with the flaps a little bit. I don't like to land full flaps if I don't have to. So maybe play with that option a little bit. My eyes right now on long final, by long final I mean I'm a half mile out, I'm 400, 300 feet, somewhere around there, I'm on my glide path. I am fixated on my point. I am just staring, let's say at that number three six. That's where I want to aim for. I know I'm not going to touch down there because I'm going to float a little bit past it. So my eyes are fixated on that number three six. I'm approaching. I'm coming in there. I'm pitching for airspeed. I'm powering for altitude. If you can commit that to your brain, you're going to do a great job. So if I'm if I'm too slow, I'm nosing down. If I'm too fast, I'm picking that nose up a few degrees. You should be flying this thing with your fingertips. Okay, no death grips. There's no. Sometimes my students, I feel like they're going to break the yoke off in their hand because their veins are bulging. They got a death grip on the yoke. You know, it's all about finesse. When we come to the point that you were talking about the most, that transition, I hate to use the word flare. I think flare is a dirty word. You know, a, a 777 or a 737 or the space shuttle would flare. In a light sport airplane or in a Cessna 150, we don't really flare. We simply just transition. And by that, I mean try to fly the airplane level down the runway. When you pick the nose up, you also pick your eyes up and put your eyes down that runway. Look towards the tree line. Use your peripheral vision to keep you, you know, left and right centered on that runway. But remember that when you transition the nose, you transition your eyes. And that is when your eyes should come up and down the runway um, to uh, help you with that. Um, one last great tip that can help you with that, Randy, uh, is slow flight down the runway. It's one of my best tips. We do slow flight in the air all the time. Now I want you to fly the perfect pattern, but when you get into ground effect, add a little bit of power and try your hardest to not let the airplane touch. Take your eyes down the runway, give it a little bit of power, and just let it float. Hold it in ground effect. Hold it off the runway. Don't let those wheels touch, but don't go so high that you're out of ground effect either. Just hold it there. That's going to help you with your control because right before you touch down, you're in slow flight, whether you know it or not. So practicing slow flight in the air and just above the runway like that um, is really going to help you with your landings. I'm sorry to ramble for so long, but I love just teaching and talking about landing. So uh, any questions on what I just said there? No, that, those all sound like good tips, and uh, we'll give that a try. I really appreciate your videos and your uh, advice. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, Randy. You have a great day. Like I was saying, uh, all this, guys, is being recorded, so maybe if I was talking too fast, uh, you'll be able to go back and listen to this um, a little bit later. Um, and uh, let's see, again, every Monday at 3 o'clock, guys, we are doing this. So uh, this is going to conclude the, um, the non-member portion of the Pilot's Inner Circle. If the Pilot's Inner Circle, if you love this show, you're going to love the Pilot's Inner Circle. I'm going to go into more depth uh, and answer some more of your questions. And we're going to talk a little bit more about passenger briefs. Um, and this clip will all be eligible for FAA WINGS credit, but that is only to Pilots Inner Circle members. So if this is something that uh, you think may be interesting to you, um, the membership is a great price. Uh, you get access to all my webinars, which, by the way, uh, uh, members, uh, tonight I am doing a, uh, a webinar at 8 p.m. my time, Eastern time, on, I want to say it's three FAA regulations you must know. Um, so that is that. So make sure you click on the webinar section, uh, my members, and sign up for that so you can jump in there. Um, and the rest, of, I'm going to go record the rest of the show for my uh, Pilots Inner Circle members. Again, something you think you guys would like, go to pilotsinnercircle.com and uh, go ahead and sign up for your membership. You will not be disappointed that much, I promise. Um, so, uh, you guys, I will talk with you all next Monday, same time, same place, same phone number, so save it so you can call in again. And most importantly, remember that a good pilot is always learning. Have a great day, guys. See ya.